Okay, mopping up minorities. So what we're talking about in this very brief little section is what happens when a bidder or gets to 90% or a single shareholder, whether it's by creep or otherwise, gets to 90%. So then we're left with minority shareholders, that remaining 10%. So the first question I have is, why does the bidder need to do anything at all? With 90% of the shares, they can pretty much do anything they like, right? Can't they? No. What can't they do? Well, and ultimately, that if we didn't have protections in place for minority shareholders, they could pretty much do what they like. But there are some reasons why they might actually want to go to the next stage. Before we even think about the defensive position, it costs a lot of money to be a listed company. And if you own 90%, if you're basically controlling the operations, if you are, particularly if you are an entity, say, that owns coal mines, you bought another listed company that owns coal mines, um, and it would be just much easier for you to deploy staff in mine A to mine B and, and can pull the management together, you could get these efficiencies out of it. But because they are separate companies, then you have this, or separate groups, then you have these other issues. So you can have, you can clearly you can have conflicts. There are a whole heap of administrative expenses that you have to pay just by being a listed company. And there are significant tax benefits by consolidating a group into one group. So how do you do it? Sorry? Yeah. Oh, it, well, by being just the cost, you now no longer have to continuously disguise. If you are a single shareholder, um, your minority shareholders, your 10% might still be hundreds, if not thousands of people, you have to continuously disclose. Um, basically, you can do anything you like when you're the 100% shareholder um, or you've brought the group down. You could become a proprietary limited entity have less than 50 shareholders, clean it up entirely. So a couple of different options. Um, clearly, you could pay a higher price. Those people who have held out, you could just pay them more. And the prohibition against paying a different price to one group of shareholders from another doesn't apply once you reach that 90% threshold. And the prohibition against collateral benefits doesn't apply once the offer closes. So you can actually sweeten the deal with those 90%. Of course, that assumes, sorry, not that 10%, that assumes that the 10% are active and engaged and they've just been holding out for this higher price or this sweeter deal. Often a big part of the 10%, people who've forgotten that they hold the shares or they just haven't opened their mail or they're just not interested in what is going on. Uh, you can go with a compulsory acquisition. There are preconditions to that. We'll work through them in a minute. Uh, you could actually then institute a scheme to restructure the end part, get court approval and effectively deal with it that way. You could do a selective capital reduction. So you could effectively buy back shares but only buy back the 90%. You could change the constitution or you could do a selective buyback. So I want to talk in particular about the compulsory acquisition uh, provisions. So when we have a bid to acquire all of the securities in a bid class, at the end of the offer period or during the offer period, um, the bidder and the associates, their associates have relevant interests in 90% of the security by number or 75% by number that the bidder offered to acquire under the bid, whether it was under the bid or not. So basically what we're talking about, oh sorry, previously it used to relate to shares, what's my other comment here, and the 75% provision is really only relevant 
if the bid commences from a holding of more than 60%. So really what the law is doing here is making sure that it's a true minority, that you have a true majority, an effective 90% at the time. And the 75% criteria can be satisfied by acquisitions outside the bid, so that includes on-market purchases. Oh, lastly, um, regu Regulatory Guide 171 modifies the test to exclude securities that were held at the beginning of the offer. So it's really looking at what did you achieve during the offer, who's left over. So once we have the precondition met, then the bidder can just give a notice. They can lodge the notice and give it to ASIC, to each holder in the bid class with a copy to the ASX. And over a period of one month, uh, they can um, basically create this new compulsory acquisition period. What's going on here? Didn't we just do that? Oh, I went backwards. Corresponding with the compulsory acquisition provisions are the compulsory, um, uh, the compulsory purchase provisions. So holders who are in that 10% can actually go to the registry and get information to confirm who all of the holders are. And that allows those remaining shareholders to talk to each other if they wish to. Um, they can only require that their shares are purchased if there isn't a court order that says that they can't. Um, and then the bidder basically needs to uh, continue with the acquisition. So that means pay, issue, transfer consideration in exchange for the transfer or execute transfers on behalf of the holders and give them to the target party company for action. Um, so it still sits in the realm of contract. There is still a contract for the acquisition of the shares, um, but it's happening as a concept. It's a mandated transaction. So proceeding with the acquisition needs to happen within 14 days after the last to occur of the notice that is given or the last list of dissenting shareholders is given or a court application is determined. Um, and it usually proceeds by the second route to avoid dealing with disgruntled or missing shareholders. So usually we are just uh, proceeding with the acquisition. So the terms of the acquisitions in these cases will be those that were applied to the acquisition under the bid when it closed. So the best offer, unconditional if conditions were removed and clearly if it went ahead then the conditions have been satisfied so they don't matter. Um, and at the highest bid price. So security holders can bring proceedings. They can apply to the Federal Court or the Supreme Court of any state for an order preventing a compulsory acquisition of their securities. There's a timetable requirement that you need to take into account. Any order will apply to all holders who have application behind, uh, before the court. So we only need one to achieve uh, to make an order, would you mind just hitting that button again for me, please? Sorry. Um, so we only need one to make an order, but if they make it as a class or if individual orders are taken, once one order is made, it'll apply to all. And the court doesn't have jurisdiction to vary the terms of the proposed transaction. The compulsory acquisition will be on the last and best terms basis. Um, there are really two critical matters that in the acquisition, compulsory acquisition cases that need to be taken into account is that balance between the onus of proof that there is, that the minimum criteria have been achieved and that the value is fair and whether or not the value is fair itself. So in relation to the onus of proof, dissenting shareholders need to show that the consideration is not fair value in order to get a, co uh, a court order to prevent the compulsory acquisition order going a um, ahead. And section 667C1 requires an assessment of the company as a whole. So again, we go to the value of the company as a whole, director's duties are to the company as a whole, not just to the particular transaction.
So allocation of value between classes and then you allocate the value of each class pro rata between the securities in order to identify how it works. So what are the target company's obligations uh, in relation to a compulsory acquisition? Uh, they need to register the bidder as the holder of the shares. They need to hold the consideration in trust for the holder immediately prior to registration. They need to give written notice to holders that consideration is held pending their instructions. Uh, they need to maintain cash consideration in a separate account so it's not mixed with target company funds. They need to hold rights or distributions accordingly, uh, accruing in respect of consideration for the beneficiaries of the trust. So effectively, the dissenting or minority shareholders become the beneficiaries of this trust. They have all, the target company has all of the duties of a trustee. It needs to invest consideration and may use the income to pay expenses. And after 12 months, it needs to follow the procedure in the Corpse Act for dealing with unclaimed property. So this is all relevant because it is often and usual that a large proportion of the minority shareholders will be lost shareholders. They'll be just people who forgot that they had a shareholding, they've moved addresses, or they just haven't responded, they haven't raised an interest. So, sorry, I'm just going to animations here, I'm trying to see what it is that I've said. Um, remaining shareholders can avoid being locked in as a minority by compelling the bidder to acquire the security, so the other side of the compulsory acquisition. Again, same test for precondition. Um, they need to give a notice to ASIC um, and the securities need to be purchased within the time limit. The notice that is given to ASIC is effectively a contract. It's an offer to sell the securities um, and require the compulsory purchase. And terms are either the same as the terms that were applied immediately before the end of the offer, same as with compulsory acquisition, or such other terms as the parties can agree. So the scheme itself or the arrangements in the law allow for direct negotiation between minority shareholders and the company. And again, remember that we're no longer constrained by the same price or collateral benefit. Uh, rules so they can be sweetened. So again very procedural, lots of filings with ASIC etc. Uh, courts are getting involved um, but largely a prescribed scheme so apples for the apples comparison for how it works. So that's all I really want to say about takeovers on the whole. I just want to have a quick look at schemes before we finish up. We might even finish up earlier than our early time if we just do the um, comparison piece. Um, but any questions there, concerns? Let's talk about schemes, baby. Okay, scheme. So what is a scheme? We're going to move to a whole new part of the Act. So Section 411 of the Corporations Act basically provides an alternative to a formal takeover bid, a scheme of arrangement. Um, Levy, Chapter 5, deals with schemes and I think is worth a read uh, if this is an area of interest to you. In its most basic form, a scheme is essentially an arrangement between the company and its shareholders, which becomes binding once the statutory tests are met. So unlike a formal takeover offer where there is basically this dance between the directors of a bidder and the directors of the target, a scheme is an arrangement between the bidder and the shareholders. So like clearly shareholders take action in a formal takeover bid, you know, they, they take action by signing the offer, uh, uh, accepting the offer or just selling their shares on market. Um, but there is a more direct engagement and negotiation between shareholders in this way. If you look at Regulatory Guide 60, it says schemes of arrangements are regulated under Part 5.1. They are binding court approved agreements that allow the reorganisation of rights and liabilities of members and the creditors of a company. <coughs> so we didn't really talk about creditors at all in the context of a takeover bid. And while directors' duties require 
um, loyalty to the company as a whole, which includes employees and creditors, um, really the focus is on value to shareholders. Uh, where in a scheme, a court is required to take into account uh, the bigger picture. So section 411 looks like this, um, where a compromise or arrangement is uh, proposed between a 5.1 body, so that's a company, a registrable body that's registered under Div 1 or 2 of Part 5B.2. Um, foreign companies, body corporates might be included here. Managed investment schemes would be included here. So it's broad reaching. Schemes apply very similarly to takeovers. So when we talk about a 5.1 body and its members, um, it's worth remembering that section 611 provides those 20 exceptions. So I've narrowed that up in that table to the gateway, but it's technically 20 different exemptions to the prohibition uh, generally. So we've discussed that primary exemption being a takeover bid and schemes sit there as the 17th, but are really, really the next most popular way of achieving what we would traditionally consider as a takeover or a merger transaction. So, what's here? Compromise, arrangements, really important piece of the terminology here, uh, but it's not actually defined in section 411 or elsewhere in the Act. Section 9 talks about an arrangement including a reorganisation of the share capital of a body corporate by the consideration shares of a different class, by the division of classes into shares of different classes, or by both of these methods. In other words, an entirely unhelpful definition. Uh, since the start of the scheme procedures in back in the 19th century in the UK, courts have effectively understood a compromise in a really narrow way. The term arrangement on the other side has tended to be liberal or broad in construction. So key case here is International Harvester, 1953 Victorian Supreme Court case. The expression there was said to embrace almost any arrangement otherwise legal which touches on or concerns the rights and obligations of the company, its members or its creditors. Um, courts have consistently held that the word arrangement isn't confined or limited by the word compromise. So what does this what does all of this mean? Ultimately, um, as Justice Haynes says in Sondine International, give and take, bargain, benefit, all of these words are useful in considering whether a proposal is arrangement or a compromise. Um, we can think about arrangement or compromise ultimately in the broad sense of commercial agreement with the knowledge, of course, that we've got one party trying to negotiate the same arrangement with a large number of individual parties because individual shareholders and because it sits where it sits in in part five or chapter five of the law we also have to think about creditors I'm not saying we don't have to think about creditors anyway but they're front and foremost so let's have a quick chat about the key elements of 411 so 411.1, a compromise or arrangement. Needs to have a part 5.1 body. We've had a look at all of that. Part 4, a scheme will be binding when it's been approved by a statutory majority and by the court. So once we've got a majority of shareholders saying they think this compromise or arrangement is going to work and the court has also said it will work, then the scheme itself can go ahead. Uh, 411.6, it sets out the power that the court has to grant approval, um, subject of course to some alterations and, uh, ex uh, and conditions. 411.17, court can only approve a scheme if it is satisfied that it is not for the purposes of avoiding Chapter 6. Now I find this particularly interesting because Chapter 6 itself assumes that people are going to use schemes effectively to get around the prohibition in 606. Um, so that has been interpreted in a very narrow way. Um, and 411.16, a court can restrain further proceedings. 
So a court can just get in the middle of all of this and say, okay, enough is enough, all these competing bids, all of these different arguments, we're going to sort it out now and this is going to be the end. So I want to talk now about the key differences between schemes and takeovers and then I think by understanding that, that will give you a really good lead in for those of you who want to use this in the essay task and I think there's also a discussion board task that um, is quite relevant here as well. Key difference is timing. A scheme takes somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks from beginning to end, from commercial terms to the end. Takeover is a minimum of 12 weeks, but effective control could be secured in a much, much shorter period. Costs. In a scheme, the bidder or the target pays. In a takeover, the bidder pays for the bidder statement, the target pays for the target statement and any independent expert reports. Ultimately, in both cases, it is the target who ultimately pays um, if the scheme is successful. Bidder will be out of pocket if it's not successful, but ultimately, it will be all these costs do go to the target. Shareholder pr approval required? Yes, for a scheme, you need to have more than 50% of all non-bidder shareholders vote, uh, voting, and that needs to represent 75% of all non-bidder shares voted. So we've got a double, it's like kind of like compulsory voting, but not quite. So 75% of all non-bidder shareholders need to be voted, and of that, 50% need to approve before a scheme can go ahead. In relation to a takeover, there isn't an independent vote of shareholders. They vote by either accepting or rejecting the deal. Unless, of course, the Constitution requires it, which may happen uh, in a limited number of circumstances. Does the court need to approve in a scheme? Yes. So you have, and shareholders do rely on this. If the court says, yeah, this is something that should go ahead, they tend to feel a lot more comfortable than just the market acting by itself. So there are two different court approvals required and other disputes will be dealt with by the court. So it's in a litigated environment. In relation to a takeover, no, um, unless there is opposition to a compulsory acquisition. Um, takeovers panel, does become involved in relation to unacceptable circumstances and is often used as a defence mechanism, but it is a panel, not a court. Do creditors need to approve? Basically, no, in either case. Assuming a combined entity is appropriately capitalised following the scheme the, and the court doesn't raise any objection, the court does need to take creditors' interest into account, but creditors aren't represented and their interest, their, their approval isn't required for a scheme unless there is some issue with the amount of capital or the target's ability to pay its debts as and when they fall due. In both cases, there are documents that ASIC needs to consider and approve. So the explanatory statement that's sent to target shareholders needs to be reviewed by ASIC and the court in relation to uh, a scheme. In a takeover, um, ASIC doesn't do any extensive review similar to, um, to the situation with prospectuses, um, certainly no extensive pre-vetting, but it needs to be lodged with them and they can raise an objection. Similarly to prospectuses, the key way that they raise objections is when competitors or people who are unhappy with the deal raise issues with them directly. Do we need an independent expert's report? In both cases, yes, you do. So strictly only for a scheme, it's only necessary if the target shareholders resolve by ordinary resolution or cross directorships, or you start with more than 30%. But in most schemes, you will find an independent expert's report is included, and courts are reluctant to move forward without them, even though there is no technical requirement. Similarly, in relation to that this one here says scheme and it should say takeover. Uh, sorry about that. Um, in a takeover, um, target's response 
Again, if there's more than 30% of the target must contain it, but again, it is quite usual for the target response to include it for a range of reasons, adds credibility to the advice that the director's giving, and also deflects some personal liability from directors um, to the independent expert. So an expert's report could also be required in order to compulsorily acquire classes of securities under the general powers as well to go to that question of fairness. So in deciding between them, how do you choose? Oh, I can't see my text in here. Sorry, I'm a little edit on the go. Clearly changed my, um, changed my slides colors and didn't notice that they got changed. There we go. Sorry, two seconds, promise. This is my changing the slides on the run face. Let's go back. How do you choose? Let's have a look at these. In a scheme, target is controlling the process. So schemes often happen in a friendly environment and basically the target is often already for sale. It's seeking uh, some sort of acquisition. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you have to look at the slide in order to work out what it is. Um, works really well when the par target uh, parties are friendly. Um, bidder has a lot of certainty with a scheme as well. So a bidder is in a position that it knows what's happening next. Where in a takeover, you're taking a bidder takes a lot more risk. Uh, in many ways, a bidder has a lot more control in a takeover process, but they're taking much more risk. They don't know what is or isn't going to be accepted. Um, and if the bid is hostile, you have no choice but to do it as a as an on market takeover. Really, um, if you've got more time, a scheme. It's a much more orderly process way of doing things, but it does or it can take longer. Having said that, there are takeover bids, because, particularly when there isn't control and they are hostile, that drag on for a very, very long time indeed. Uh, higher thresholds are required to achieve 100% in a takeover bid. Um, so if you are looking for 100%, a scheme can be a much more efficient way for a target to achieve that. Um, Cost-wise, so we can think about expert reports. Expert reports are required less often for a takeover bid, but ultimately I don't think there's a huge difference in cost, and we're seeing them more and more anyway. Uh, there's a lot more structural flexibility in relation to a, a scheme as well. Um, a court can be much more creative as to what the end merge entity looks like. And of course, with the scheme, the Chapter 6 provisions don't apply. So rules against collateral benefits, for example, um, aren't relevant in a scheme. Um, and that adds flexibility to the deal structure that isn't available in a takeover scenario. Sorry, I'm now making some judicious choices because of time. Just gonna have a quick look at now. I will continue on here for a second. So, anti avoidance provision. So, I mentioned earlier uh, that four eleven seventeen says that the court is not allowed to approve a scheme if it thinks it's a contravention of uh, chapter six. In practice, this is dealt with by getting a statement from ASIC that says ASIC doesn't accept. This is completely convention. There is no law that says that that is what, to ha what happens. And ASIC's principle concerning granting that sort of statement is the adequacy of disclosure, which is something that you might find interesting. Very much sits behind that ASIC value of making sure that the punters know what the risks and liabilities are associated with whatever the transaction is, takeover or otherwise. But I do find this interesting because A is very clear, not being proposed for the purpose of enabling a person to avoid the operation of Chapter 6, when actually in practice, People are deciding, do we go down a scheme or a Chapter 6 route to achieve this transaction? And in friendly transactions, 
a scheme is just as likely to be chosen. Um, no, I'm not. There's slides about managed trust, but um, I'm not going to talk about those for the moment. I am going to really. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to move forward for a second to the process. So for a 411 scheme, what does this scheme actually look like? It starts up in front, up at the beginning between and with an agreement, usually between the target and the bidder. The proposed transaction is disclosed, then an application is made to the court, a meeting of shareholders is held, the court then approves the notice of the meeting, um, so it approves the meeting documentation, uh, it approves, sorry, the application is made, the court approves the meeting documentation, the meeting then takes place, the court then gives its approval or otherwise to the outcome of the meeting, so 50% of at least 75% of the non-aligned shareholders vote at this stage, court then approves and then the scheme gets implemented. So a, an agreement between the target and the bidder is usually called a merger or a scheme implementation agreement. It's a binding contract. Um, I'm going to tell you what kind of things you'll see in it because we're not going to run out of time otherwise. But basically it will include a statement of the kind of things that have been agreed. It will incorporate any conditions precedent. It will set out what these transaction steps. It will set out what the consideration is, what the parties are. It's really just straight old contract law. Really easy. Any of you could do it right now to just Google scheme implementation and have a look at one. I would suggest that you do that and have a look then, do the same thing with a bidder statement and a target statement and look at the consistency of the kind of information that we see in practice. Other things that you wouldn't see in takeovers documents include things like exclusivity provisions. Um, so, and of course you get defined terms, interpretation, etc., etc. Um, actually, yeah, I'm not going to talk so much about the scheme documents themselves. Lockup devices are quite common. So they are provisions in the scheme arrangement that basically create that exclusivity or create protections for the bidder um, to ensure that the transaction itself isn't going to be used as a way of effectively putting the company on the market. So if a target is interested in courting many different suitors, it might be more interested in um, a takeover bid being made because then a competitive bid could be made to match it. But in a scheme, we have a binding arrangement where the target is pretty much locked into the deal provided that shareholders and the court approve. So the kinds of ways that the contract is locked up are things like including provisions, we call them no shop provisions. So they prevent parties from taking action to, um, to go and get other bidders in. Uh, it might include a go shop provision, which is effectively a provision that says if, uh, if somebody has made a bid, uh, that it needs to be matched. Uh, exclusivity in relation to um, or prohibitions in relation to talking to particular employees, rights to match, locking up assets and the big one that we see a lot of are break fees. So if the deal doesn't go ahead for any reason other than shareholders not approving or the court not approving and there are limits around that because that would limit the ability of the target, for example, to advise shareholders to vote no or to do anything to prevent shareholders to vote, then a payment is made, a break fee is paid. And it's usually about as close to a penalty as you can get without it actually being a penalty. Break fees are... On larger private transaction, break fees are not at all uncommon. Um, because they, they're a mechanism effectively for ensuring that 
you're not spending good money after bad, really, because it's it's costly to do due diligence and to negotiate a significant transaction. And if you are just doing that for the purpose of establishing a price or a baseline which others can come in over the top of, um, then that uh, you want a disincentive to that happening. Uh, sorry, what have I got on this slide? Okay. Takeover's panel will look at lock-up devices um, and consider whether a lock-up device creates an unacceptable circumstance. Um, director's duties are very relevant to lock-up devices because triggers for a break fee can often include one or more of the directors withdrawing their recommendation or uh, otherwise affecting the way that shareholders vote. But of course, directors' duties are to act first for the company. So by contractually binding a company to pay a large fee, if they say don't, inv don't vote in favour of this transaction, and it turns out down the track that the deal wasn't as good as it first looked for some reason, there can be a real conflict of interest there because the directors themselves have created a negative for the company in some way. Um, what else? Fiduciary out clauses provide for the severance of unlawful clauses. They're quite, uh, quite common in lock-up contracts um, to try and balance that. But I personally think lock-ups are particularly fraught for directors if they are going to go to the recommendation um, so I've just got some notes in here. Let me see if there's something in particular I want to talk to you about. Um, if you're looking for a case in relation to this, Justice Five Freiburg's decision in Mincom, M-I-N-C-O-M, uh, might be useful. Uh, this is a scheme hearing. Um, no shop and no talk clauses and a break free he found didn't prevent the court from making orders to convene scheme meetings in circumstances where there was no evidence of any realistic likelihood of an alternative proposal. Contract law, so genuine pre-estimate of damages. So lock up a payment, a lock up payment, question as a matter of contract law is, is it a penalty? So a penalty cannot be enforced. Is it a genuine pre-estimate of the damage or the cost that could be associated with the time and effort conducting that due diligence or otherwise? So an unreasonable penalty or an unreasonable lock-up payment, uh, there may in fact be a dispute about whether or not that can be enforced. Another thing to think about from a director's duties point of view is whether a break fee could be in a, a financial assess, assistance. So the general proposition here is a company law proposition is that a company cannot financially assist a person or entity to acquire its own shares, shares in itself. So is the imposition of a break fee or a lockup device in a contract in a scheme or original scheme document, is that a financial assistance that otherwise would be prohibited? And that's something as lawyers that we have to turn our mind to as we think about these things. Um, Takeover's panel, Guidance Note 7, talks about lock-up devices and is probably, even though it's probably the bullet that I'm giving you pretty much last, uh, is the one that you would find a good summary of what it is that you need to look up and the pre look at and the pre the pri premium question there is whether the arrangement itself is an anti-competitive or a coercive arrangement and if it's either of those things it will be an unacceptable circumstance so talked about uh, reaching agreement disclosure requirements the prospectus requirements in 6D do not have effect in relation to offers made under a scheme. The notice itself needs to be accompanied by an explanatory statement which explains the difference or explains the effect of the compromise. Um, relevant sections there. It states 
the material interests of the directors in any capacity and the effect of those interests on the transaction. So it's again, it's looking for related parties and associations. Um, it in, needs to include all of the information that the regulations require and there are quite a few regulations that are relevant and include information material to making a decision being information that was in, is within the knowledge of the directors or has not been previously disclosed. So the standard here is slightly less than uh, the prospectus standard. Um, and it really goes to a question of whether or not there is solvency. Uh, and so it's important if the scheme is, and we call them a solvent scheme, because it's there to reorganise the voting shares as opposed to reorganise capital from a creditor's perspective, you register it as a solvent scheme with ASIC at the very beginning. So the disclosure documents need to be, once they're with ASIC, they need to be reviewed by the court. And an approved scheme gets its force from the court order, not from the resolution of the members and creditors or creditors. It will not be approved by the court in most cases if it's not approved by members, but it gets its efficacy from that court approval. Court seeks to satisfy itself that the scheme complies with the law was approved on the basis of adequate information by shareholders and creditors, or creditors as the case is required, or is sufficiently fair and reasonable that an intelligent and honest shareholder or creditor acting alone might approve it. So it's interesting to me that there is this two-prong test that shareholders, 75% of non-involved shareholders need to vote, at least 50% of them need to approve it, but even still, the court needs to decide that it's sufficiently fair and reasonable. Court will consider whether the applicant has brought to its attention all of the matters that could be considered relevant and that there's been a reasonable opportunity for ASIC to examine the terms of the scheme, a scheme that undermines the policy underlying provisions of the Corporations Act will not ordinarily be approved. Um, that language comes from the ASIC website and I'm not aware of any case where the court has said this undermines the, pro, uh, the, the policy but we're going to approve it anyway. ASIC's primary concern is disclosure. We mentioned that earlier um, and basically a lot of this should be quite familiar to you. If they refer in their guidance to the 602 provisions, which is basically Eggleston. They're interested in sufficient time to make a decision, sufficient information to make a decision, and reasonable and equal opportunities. So fairness and transparency underlie all of this. Explanatory statement needs to be accompanied by experts report. If the other party to a reconstruction or a scheme of arrangement holds at least 30%, so the equivalent of our bidder, we need to have that expert's report. Courts like the expert's report, so they're quite common even when the th threshold is lower than 30%. Experts are specifically required to state whether or not in their opinion the pres pres proposed scheme is in the best interest of the members, which is slightly different from best interest of the company. Um, and they need to set out their reasons for that opinion. Experts also need to make a declaration that they are not an associate of uh, the equivalent of the bidder. So they need to make an independent statement. If an expert's report contains a forecast or a forward-looking financial statement and the statement uh, or a statement that the market value of an asset or something is or a statement relating to a market value, then the report actually can't be uh, accompany the statement unless ASIC has approved that. So experts' reports that include actual valuations need to be vetted first. Not to be outdone by ASIC and the court, the ASX has a say as well. Chapter 7 is what is relevant. ASIC Chapter 7 says that shareholders need to receive information about the effect of the reconstruction on the number of shares, convertible securities, options, etc. The target needs to notify ASX 
that the application to a court has been made and the listing rules require uh, the, or, or impact the way that options and share premium accounts are dealt with and in basically to ensure that all shareholders benefit proportionally from the scheme. So scheme documents can get quite complex because it'll say, you know, under corporations rule X and ASX listing rules Y and, and listing out each of the provisions, this is the information that's disclosed. And it's similar but slightly different in each case. Um, as I mentioned before, there are two applications that need to be made to the court, an application for orders to convene the meeting and an application after the meeting is held to once the to approve the scheme. I'm really starting to travel fast now, so tell me if I need to slow down. Uh, things that the court needs to take into account. Ultimately, it'll look at the opposition to the application, whether the judge hearing the matter is familiar with the schemes of arrangement generally, and anything that ASIC has uh, contributed here. So ASIC becomes a quasi-representative or agent for the broader shareholder group and it very much sees its role there as representing shareholders. Um, detailed consideration of fairness tends to be left to the second application because the second application is only made once 75% of the non-aligned shareholders have voted and 50% of them have approved it. Um, there's some pretty busy slides here. Um, I'm just going to run through them. But at the first application, what is important is that the court will look at whether the proposal fits within the concept of a scheme of arrangement. Does this deal make sense? Is it consistent with those laws? Will the information that is being made available allow members to make a fully informed decision. Did ASIC get a reasonable opportunity to examine the proposal? Um, and is there any reason that can be foreseen at this point why the court would reject the proposal if it's approved? So that can be addressed before it goes to the members. Um, things that are commonly addressed here might include things like credit or performance risk. And this is based on the principle that the holders of securities will automatically be divested if they don't uh, bear any credit risk. The acquisition of encumbered uh, securities, so what does this mean when securities have been used as a, um, uh, as, as it sounds funny to say securities have been used for security for some other transaction, but Basically what the court is looking at here is balancing the right of third parties who aren't a party to the scheme but might have a beneficial interest in the security itself because that's security or those shares a security for some other financial transaction, some loan or mortgage or otherwise. And they will also consider the lockup devices which we've already spoken about. Something on break fees. So I'd really interested in uh, the, the look at is the scheme of life that you know, that on like that on the device you like to take the capital yeah. Okay. Thirty eight million. On a four point three billion dollar transaction. Oh okay. One percent. And uh, the reverse break fee was thirty eight million. So that was it. So they match them. Yeah, they match them. Okay. Um, I, I haven't looked at it, so um, but the scheme is again looking at the scheme documents. You can see uh, you look at a couple of them, and you see that the, you are able to compare apples with apples to a certain extent. It is it's not as regulated as the takeovers regime is, but at the end of the day, it's still underlying these Eggleston principles: transparency, fairness, and that equality. And it is a combination of how does the Corporation Act work here? and that underlying value of, well, we'll just tell people everything they need to know and then they'll make an informed decision uh, that's contrasted then with how do we have an efficient market um, where transactions can happen quickly um, and in the most co cost-effective way. And then sort of in between that are commercial people who want to minimise risk and maximise return. Um, in relation to the meeting, which is the next part, 
I, the provision is there, but I think what is important is to understand this 50% of 75% rule. So in order for a vote to be effective, a majority in the number of members present and voting in person by proxy and the number of members that you need to make it work needs to represent at least 75%. So in practice, given that not all members attend meetings, this could actually represent a much lower percentage than the 90% requirement under a takeover bid. Because it ultimately becomes, a when you think about it, it's a compulsory acquisition. It's a compulsory transaction of some sort where it's either exchange of shares for shares or just a payout of cash or whatever it is. It's a, a scheme basically forces a compulsory transaction on others. Um, so again, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to work through the detail of this here, but I mean, I've got slides here that are bordering on being a textbook with the number of uh, the num amount of text in here. My point was trying to summarise the key points enough for you to be able to follow. So we're going even higher level at the moment. Um, HIH is an important decision that you. I would suggest that you have a look at um, because it basically goes to what the responsibilities of the company are, the target company are, at presenting information to the members at a meeting and what needs to be addressed in the meetings. Thinking too about de determining whether there are different classes, it's important to think about this in the context of se uh, secured and unsecured creditors, for example. <laughs> I'll just get all the animations out on the slide. So whether an unsecured creditor is all, who is also a shareholder can form a separate class will depend on the circumstances. Mostly not, but it does need to be addressed because shareholders who are also creditors will have a different set of interests to ordinary shareholders. Whether members or creditors who are also promoters of a scheme are different from other creditors, you would need more information to determine that. It really goes down to how similar or dissimilar their interests are. The courts are going to take into account the disclosures that have been made and the extent to which a scheme involves forgiveness of internal debts, separate treatment of separate parties. And then another way that this issue comes up is whether a member or a creditor who will benefit in a particular way on the implementation of a scheme can form a different class from other members or creditors who don't get that benefit, even though the scheme proposes to deal with their rights as members or creditors in the same way. So it really comes down to timing here. Uh, there's a whole lot of cases on these kinds of issues. Um, and ultimately the test is are the interests that are being dealt with the same and are the outcomes sufficiently similar? It's kind of a version of love your children the same by treating them differently, but if you're loving them differently by treating them differently, then they're probably different classes and they need to be assessed in a different way. So having looked at all of those things, let's look at what the court does when it's reviewing a scheme. We mentioned this earlier, the kind of these three main tests. Does it comply with the law? Was it approved on the basis of adequate information? And is it sufficiently fair? So courts will look at the process. It will look at what ASIC's, term, um, ASIC's interests are. It will be looking for a valid resolution of members, so it will be doing the counting and the process, etc. Um, it will also be considering whether there's been a proper allocation of classes, because a class, as we've just been talking about, is not necessarily just a separate class of securities. It might be a separate class of interest holders. Um, and it's very rigid and black letter on complying with the rules in the right way. So in relation to um, whether it's approved on the basis of adequate information, uh, it will look like you do when you are issuing shares under a prospectus is, did something new happen in the intervening time that needs to be brought to the attention of the members? 
Um, and it's also going to look at whether ASIC attended and what they said, what ASIC view is. Generally, if at the second hearing ASIC doesn't show up, the court will assume that ASIC has no issue. And then lastly, um, really the probably the, the most law in this area as opposed to just checking off that procedure has been followed consistently is whether an appropriate test of fairness and reasonableness has been applied um, with, and that test is whether an intelligent and honest creditor or member, as depending on what we're talking about, properly was properly informed and acting alone would have approved that scheme cases in RMA. Uh, could be worth looking at Finkelstein in CSR. Um, we said CSI earlier when I said CSIRO and we actually meant CSR, by the way. It's been bugging me that I just had the wrong thing in my head all morning, but thank you, CSR. Um, Justice Barrett also in Centro. Um, look at this idea of commercial morality. So closely linked in with Professor Finn's idea of reasonableness in uh, or, or a good faith in contract. But is there a concept of corporate or commercial morality in scheme arrangements? So let's have a look at what ASIC does. Ooh, one more. No, a couple more. Now, get back. Okay, so ASIC gets to review the documents along the way. It's only after a court approval is given for the convening of the meeting that it registers the explanatory statement. ASIC, I just mentioned before, generally only a 10 second meeting if it has an objection or an issue. Um, and there is a regulatory guide that deals with the no objection statements. So no object to demonstrate fairness, interested parties should not vote on the resolution to approve the scheme, even if they don't constitute a separate class. It's the kind of statement that they will make. Okay, court. Yeah, let's not do that. Ah, good. So last stage, sorry, I've just got something. Last stage, so we've got our court approval in place, then we go and implement. The other place where disputes can happen in relation to this is when we've got implementation on the run uh, and implementation happens in uh, differently from what it is that was uh, um, actually approved. So that is absolutely everything that I want to say today. I know I've skipped a number of slides to make sure that we get there. You guys look exhausted. I know I am. I bet you guys are listening. That's a ridiculous amount of me to listen to. Uh, any questions, concerns, frustrations, applause, dancing, compliments? Compliments and kudos to you all. If you have questions about the assignment, you know how to find me. Um, could we get a little discussion board put up for that last assignment so we could talk to you there about Yeah, sure. Okay, I will do that before I leave the room. But um, yeah, so what we'll do is that I will try and keep announcing and keeping in touch. But if you have questions, go with that. All right, thanks, guys. Thank Big summer. Yeah, thanks.